All right. Turn to Hebrews. Uh, if you're just here for us because of the child dedication, you're jumping into a conversation we've been having for, I guess, only two Sundays in the book of Hebrews, and this conversation is going to last at least until May, maybe, maybe a little bit later on. Uh, but we're in Hebrews chapter 1, our third of this sermon series. Uh, we'll read verses 4 to 14. Hebrews 1, 4 to 14. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. and The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Let's commit our time in this passage to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we uh, just read this passage, we recognize that there's a whole bunch of Old Testament quotations here, and there's a, kind of an underlying way of thinking that is foreign to us. And so, uh, as always, we recognize our inability by our own efforts to understand this text in the way that you would want us to in a way that molds us and shapes us into the image of Jesus Christ for your glory. And so we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that you would illuminate this text so that we would hear only that which your Holy Spirit desires to use as the double-edged sword. Lord, we ask that you would pierce into our souls and our spirits. We pray that there is no place within us that is inaccessible to you because of the sin and hardness of our hearts. And Lord, may we leave here different people than when we came in because of the work that you have done within our lives. Amen. One of my favorite Christmas movies, uh, actually it's probably in my top five to six movies of all time, is a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. It's made in 1946, and it stars the incomparable Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey. He's a husband, he's a father of four, he's a business owner, and through his business, he's trying to save this little town of Bedford Falls, New York, from being overtaken by the greedy bank owner. And on Christmas Eve, George leaves a deposit of $8,000 back then, a lot of money, in the hands of his uncle, uh, Billy. And on his way to the bank to make this deposit, Billy loses that money. And when George finds out that that money is lost, he realizes that he's going to lose everything. He's going to lose his company, and when he loses his company, he's going to lose the town And not only that, but he is going to be sent to jail for not making his payments. He is devastated. And as he begins drinking and wandering the town of Bedford Falls, he starts to believe that his wife and his children and his company and everybody that he knows is going to be better off without him. And so he wanders over to this bridge and The bridge, it's Christmas, the bridge is is iced over and the water is freezing and he stands there and contemplates throwing himself in the river, ending his life and making everything better for everybody else. 
But just as he is drunkenly contemplating ending his life, who shows up? His guardian angel, Clarence Oddbody, finds himself in the water. He has propelled himself from heaven into these waters of Bedford Falls because in answer to the prayers of his family, he is there to save George from himself. So George sees this this struggling individual in the water and jumps in and saves Clarence. But actually, Clarence has saved George. And what, George, what, what Clarence then does for George is he shows him what the town would have looked like if it hadn't been for George's good deeds over the course of his lifetime, going back to when he was a boy, saving his brother from drowning. And the movie progresses, and the final scene is this truly wonderful scene as George returns to Clarence on the bridge, and then having realized how good his life is, how how truly blessed is, and and how largely irrelevant the $8,000 is, he runs through this town in this dramatic scene, happily greeting everything and everybody, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to the grocery store, and Merry Christmas to this person, and Merry Christmas to that person. And he ends up in his house in the last scene. And when he gets there, he finds a large group of people, friends, family, uh, co-workers, fellow businessmen. And what they have done, because uh, his brother and his wife, is they have told the town what has happened. And they've come together and in a show of love and support, they have donated enough money not only to cover the $8,000 deposit, but even more than that. The occasion is joyous, and Christmas carols are being sung. And then the focus comes on George and his little daughter, Zuzu. Great name for those of you who have yet to have a girl. And as George is holding his youngest daughter in his arms, a little bell on the tree starts ringing. And as cute as little Zuzu did, she says, Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. George answers, That's right. That's right. And then the final th- this final scene is George glancing up towards heaven and saying, Attaboy, Clarence. Now, those of you who are familiar with the film will recall that Clarence the angel is is not really all that intimidating a figure. In fact, I think we should go so far as to say that he's a little bit goofy looking. He's an older gentleman, looks like he's in in his 60s, and what we find out about Clarence throughout the movie is that he has never seemed to be able to get any one of his assignments right. There's something that he always does uh, when he's sent by heaven to earth to do what he's doing that he just fumbles and bumbles, which is why in this movie he's considered to be a guardian angel second class. In other words, he doesn't have his wings yet. He has to earn them by doing something good for somebody. He's not an imposing figure at all. His, His voice is just what you would expect of an older gentleman. Uh, There's nothing exceptional about him. He's kind of, he looks a little bit short and pudgy and he's got this kind of squeaky voice and he's bald. And he certainly would not be the kind of person that you would look at if you had to pick from a lineup and say, who's the angel here? He would not be the guy that you would pick. He's not the kind of guy that would be intimidated by him. It wouldn't strike fear into the heart of anybody. If you see him, if you hear him talk, you would just consider him to be just a really nice old man. There is quite simply nothing impressive about Clarence, the guardian angel. Now, the reason why I speak about this movie, and Clarence in particular, is that as as Christians, uh, we have a certain kind of perspective on angels that is, uh, I, I think, fairly safely assumed is more culturally defined Uh, more imagined, more crafted by Hallmark or Hollywood uh, than biblically defined. And it is without a doubt 
vastly different than the view of angels that the readers of Hebrews had. Now, we probably will never understand. I I think when you first read the book of Hebrews, it's probably striking if you're going to actually admit to it that why does the author of Hebrews care so much about angels? I mean, for most of us, when we think of angels, we think of Cupid or we think of Clarence or we think of something else. Uh, And we certainly have no sort of conception of, of why you would need to compare the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to angels. But what we did know, what we do know about this group is that they had a very unique perspective of angels. It seems fairly obvious that they didn't believe angels were anything like Clarence. They were nothing like Cupid. They were nothing like these sort of affable characters that we receive from our entertainment sources. They had the opposite perspective. It it is apparent that there was a group of people that that held beliefs that were, I think, largely gleaned from Scripture, but taken to a place that they shouldn't have taken it. They they believed what they needed to from the Old Testament, but but then what they did was they they just put it on steroids. They exaggerated this uh, to the point where there's some question as to whether or not maybe even they were worshiping these angels. We, I think it's unwise to reconstruct too much of history here, but it seems that this group of people to which Hebrews was written were intrigued with these angelic beings. They held them in too high a regard. They, they thought about them too often. They were in awe of their power, and they, they exaggerated their role in the redemptive purposes of God. And judging from the arguments for the superiority of Christ over angels, it seems that this was a significant threat to their Christian beliefs. Remember, the the, the Hebrews is all about a book telling Old Testament believers who have now become New Covenant believers why they should not go back to their Old Covenant beliefs. And so this role of angelic activity in God's providential working was part of their desire to go back. So whatever the church to which Hebrews was written believed about angels... The author of the book believed it absolutely essential to establish the superiority of Jesus to all angelic creatures. That's what he does here in chapter 1 for for the bulk of its verses. Christ is better. Christ is supreme. He is superior to the angels. And in doing so, the author is again, going to emphasize the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant, and therefore, the foolishness of turning back from the gospel of Jesus Christ to anything else. Now, I wanted to take this opportunity, it's a little bit sort of out of the purview of the text, to just sort of ask a question, what do we know about angels? I'm assuming that most of you have never actually pulled up an angelology. In fact, I was trying to think this morning if I've ever read of one. I can't recall offhand. Uh, so what I want us to do is to make sure that we understand what angels are. So we might not be worshiping angels, but I think it's good for us to understand what angels are because if we understand what angels are, then we'll be able to understand why the author is saying what he does about Christ. Let me, let me put angels in their place so that you can see Christ as the, as the supreme and not be tempted in any way to get overly involved in angels. See, as Christians, we like mysterious stuff. We like, uh, we like questions that are unanswerable, right? And so the, the more we actually know about angels, the more we'll realize that we should probably not be all that concerned about them. So, let me just begin here with completely irrelevant statistics. Um, The word angel occurs in 34 of the 66 books of the Bible, 108 times in the Old Testament, and depending on textual variants, over 165 times in the New Testament. I have no idea what that means. Probably nothing. But 
I did the work to find it, so I might as well share it with you. So, what do we know about them? We know that they're created. Angels, uh, no less than humans, are, a, are created at a point in time. Angels are not eternal beings. They're finite in the sense that they have a beginning, and if God should, cho- should so choose, they would have an end. Each angel is a direct creation. That is to say that angels do not reproduce. They're not little angel babies, little angel dedication services. When God created the angels, there was a set number of angels, and that is all the angels that, they will, that there will ever be. So they don't procreate. Uh, we don't know when angels were created, although I think it probably is fairly likely that they were created before Genesis 1.1. They must have been created righteous and upright for the simple fact that God does not create anything that is evil. Uh, there are several texts, and we won't get into these, which seem to suggest very vaguely that there was an act of rebellion in heaven. And as a result of that rebellion, the demonic forces following uh, this rebellion were removed from heaven. So angels are created. Uh, what, what are they like? Like, what, what, are they, what is their nature like? Well, we don't have, you know, we don't want to get too far into this, but we know that angels are intelligent, but not omniscient. Uh, We know that they're intelligent, but they do not possess the same ability to act and think that God does. Angels can't read your minds. They can't do anything like that, right? They, they, They can think and use their thinking, but they're not in any way omniscient. Their knowledge does not bump up against that of God in any sort of way. Uh, Scripture seems to suggest that they experience a level of emotion, uh, particularly when they're sent by God as ministering spirits, uh, and that they freely exercise their wills. In other words, angels are not robots. They're not, they're not programmed by God just going about following their, their programming, they're, nor are they like a hive mind, right, where they all just kind of follow the, the, the operations of one sort of central computer or anything like that. Uh, We know that angels are spirit beings, but they're not spirit beings the way God is a spirit being. God's existence is categorically, qualitatively, and quantitatively different than any other of the created order. And so they're immaterial, but they do not possess a physical body. They They possess a spiritual body. They have no flesh or no bones. Now, what does that mean? That means they have spatial limitations. They're located to one particular spot. Now, let me just interject here. I love the confidence in people to say, the devil is out to get me. Wow. Considering that he is a singular fallen angel and seems to have access to the entire universe, you are pretty freaking arrogant to suggest that he's got you in his sights. I think the devil has far more things to do in opposition to God's promises than give you a flat tire on the way to a job interview, right? So let's just remember, angels, demons, they're spatially located. They're immaterial, so we can't see them, but they're not immaterial the way God is immaterial, And so angels are not omnipresent. They're not omniscient. They don't know everything. They can't read minds. They they got to figure things out on their own. And they're not omnipresent. They can only be in one place at one time. How powerful are they? So if they're created, and if they're intelligent but not omniscient, if they have spatial locations, if they you know, have have sort of these significant limitations, how powerful are they? Well, we know that they can uh, assume the form of humans and appear as humans. Now, when I say that, let me also remind you that they don't do this on their own. When they appear in Scripture in physically visible form, it's always in service of God because He has sent them to do something. It's not like, hey, it's not like the, the gods, right, of, of 
ancient cultures that just sort of be, take human form, wander around. It's not how this works. Okay, this is not up to them. We also know that angels, if sent by God, uh, have appeared in visions and in dreams. Right, the story of uh, of how Joseph and Mary found out their significance for God's redemptive purposes is, is an example of the physical appearing of an angel as well as the appearance of an angel in visions and dreams. Uh, we know that when they do appear in, in physical form, their physical form is, is real. They're, it's corporeal. They, they, they can be seen by us. They can be conversed with by us. And regardless of the shape or form that they might assume, uh, the reaction to angels uh, is uh, to express some sort of agitation. Uh, it's not like Clarence. It's not like Cupid, right? When you're in the presence of an angel, there is a sensation that you are in the presence of something more powerful and more connected to God than you are. We get reactions like fear, loss of composure, loss of consciousness. In other words, the typical response in the Bible for anyone who has seen an angel, who has been sent by an angel by God to minister to them, is to be extremely fearful. So angels, though powerful, they are not omni omnipotent. Their power, like ours, is limited. It's derivative. So their power comes, like our power, as a result of God's creation of us and his providential ruling over us. Same thing for the angels. All angelic power, Scripture is patently clear, is subject to God's power and God's purpose. There's no angel, holy or fallen, that can do anything that God does not allow them to do. It's not like they run wherever they want, doing whatever they want, and God is like, ah, i got to clean up this mess again, right? That's not how it works. We know that angels have been used for as ministers of judgment by God. We're told in Genesis 19 that angels are used by God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, we're told in 2 Kings, when we were there in our look at David, we were told that one angel killed 185 thousand Assyrians. We know that from Matthew 28, the resurrection story, an angel moved a seemingly unmovable stone from which Jesus then walked out. In Acts chapter 12, an angel entered a locked prison and popped the lock and released Peter. And in the, in, later on in that chapter, we read that an angel struck down Herod. Angels appear in the book of Revelation uh, they're even influencing the phenomena of nature to God's judgmental purposes. We know that there are sort of two, I don't know, the right word is two orders or two categories of angels. There's the elect angels, the, the holy angels, the, the ones that are, are righteous and have maintained that, and that there are evil angels, fallen angels. Uh, at one point in the past, there was a rebellion, it seems, and, and uh, Satan and all of those who were following him were thrown out of heaven as judgment. And following that, it seems to be, that was their one and only chance to choose you this day whom you will serve. Go with him, you go that way. Go with that, stay with God, you go that way. And so God preserves the elect and holy angels in their righteous condition and he has preserved the evil angels in their fallen condition, never to be redeemed. So why do we deny the possibility of redemption for fallen angelic beings? Well, it's quite simple. Scripture tells us that that won't happen. There's no record anywhere in Scripture of an angelic being being offered the opportunity to turn from their wickedness. Uh, there's no record in Scripture of anything that comes even remotely close to demonic repentance. And whenever we read about the impact of the cross on the powers, the authorities, the spiritual beings, it is always portrayed as judgment and never salvation. 
We don't read about justification, forgiveness, redemption, adoption, regeneration being available to any one of the angelic beings. And then we have this little text in Hebrews that we'll come across in a few weeks. Chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, which says very simply, right? Jesus took on human flesh in order to save humans. Those will be the only species that will ever be offered salvation because it is the only, it is the incarnation of Jesus that makes it happen. And so that passage says it's not angels that he helps, but the offspring of Abraham. How many angels are there? A lot. A multitude announced them, announced the birth of Jesus, however much you think a multitude is. Um, God is called many, many times in the Old Testament, Yahweh of hosts, God of hosts, Lord of hosts. And uh, that is a suggestion that he is the head of a very large army. Oh, we've got a couple of references to 12 legions of angels. Now, in the, in the Roman army, a legion was 6,000. So 6,000 times uh, 12 legions is 72,000 angels. Is that all of them? Probably not. Revelation 5 refers to a myriad of angels. Well, myriad is 10,000, right? But nothing suggests there that that's all of them. So there's 72,000 over here and there's 10,000 over there. Probably not referring to all of the angels as a totality, but just to angels doing their different things at different times. In Daniel, well, Daniel messes things up even more because he talks about a thousand thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands of angels that stand before the Lord. So then there's lots of them. Regardless of how many there are, their numbers are fixed, they don't procreate, so we've got a large number of angels that exist, and that's all. So what do they do? What do angels do? If that's who angels are, what do they do? Well, their, their primary role is twofold. One, worship. Worship. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what we're going to be doing in all, for all of eternity, right? When you, when you have the beatific vision of God, how can you do anything other than worship? The second thing that they do, as Scripture suggests, is they serve they worship God and they serve God. According to Psalm 103, angels do God's word. They obey the voice of his word and they do his will. Uh, again, it, the, the, we don't want to read too much into this, but it seems as though God will, again, using our sanctified imagination, God will say to Gabriel, Gabriel, I need this done. Can you go and do this? And then the angel will respond to the voice of his word and do his will perfectly. Uh, they provide guidance and protection for God's people. We see that in the Old Testament. We see the guarding and protecting of God's people. Uh, we see the, the, the working of angels on behalf of God for the nation of Israel. So not just individuals, but also the entire nation. So when you look at angels, uh, one of the things that kind of, uh, that I thought as I was going through angels is just like, that's really not that impressive. <laughs> you know, like, like these angels are supposed to be these, you know, as a kid, you think of angels and you think of demons. And, and I unfortunately read the Frank Peretti series when I was younger, right? Don't read that right? Because you get this mentality that up above this church right now, angels and demons just brawling it out, and you're like, that is awesome. But then when you study Scripture, you realize that's not really all that true. And it pales in comparison to Jesus Christ and God in his Trinitarian existence. So when you realize that what we know about angels is impressive because it's mysterious, we also realize that there's more that we don't know about angels than what we do know. And when you put those two things together, uh, you can kind of understand the danger that exists for 
uh, for people like this Hebrew congregation, right? To take the mystery and elevate it and then to forget about what angels really are and who they are and what they do and instead believe the mystery and the hype rather than the actual nature and then you create this elevated opinion. And the more elevated your opinion of something becomes beyond what the revelation of God allows you to do, the more danger there is that you are going to shift your devotion, shift your worship away from God and onto whatever object you choose. So the purpose of our passage remains the same even though we are not going to suffer from the same disease that these people in this congregation suffered. We, we, I'm assuming, are not tempted to worship angels, but we do need to hear the message that Jesus is better, that Jesus is more superior to the angels. So take what you would consider to be. Take, if you want to sort of take the hierarchy of, of powerful knowledgeable beings in God's creation, you can put angels just kind of right under God. They're powerful creatures, mysterious creatures. And what our author wants you to hear is that no matter how powerful and how knowledgeable, no matter how mysterious a creature is in this world, Jesus is so much more, so much better he has so much supremacy and superiority. And so as we go through this, let's make sure that we're listening to what our author is saying. Jesus is better. He is supreme in all things, even over these powerful, mysterious creatures known as angels. The passage is really simple. He makes this thesis statement, which is really kind of a conclusion of the first section there where he's talked about uh, eight things that God has, or, or sorry, that Jesus is, and now, he's, and now he's shifting to this contrast, this superiority language. We've just been told that after making the perfect purification for sins, in verse 3, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. He did this, then verse 4 says, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now there's a, a lot in there that can be confusing for us. So we have to tread lightly here based upon what we've already read about who Jesus is. So what is this name that he inherited? Well, given the context, I think it's fairly obvious that the name being referred to here is Son, is Son. And that the time in view is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and his exaltation at the right hand of the Father where he sits, sits down, and then he receives his name. Now, remember this, okay? Remember the conversation we had last week. For those of you who weren't here, I apologize. So we know, based upon this text and others, that in eternity past, there was a covenant of redemption that the Father and the Son and the Spirit made in order to save a people unto himself. And so when the Son came down to fulfill the stipulations of that covenant on our behalf in his passive and active obedience, following that completion, he showed up in heaven and he says to the Father, again, using our sanctified imagination, okay, Father, do you remember in eternity past where you made promises to me of the things that I would receive if I were to become the divine mediator of this redemptive covenant? The Father says, yes, absolutely, I'm omniscient. Why are you asking the question? And the Son says, well, now I've finished it, I'll give everything to me. And so part of that inheritance, part of his sonship, includes his mediatorial office in fulfillment of his redemptive covenant. And so it's not 
talking about the Son as reference to, well, he became God following that, because we're already told in verse 2 that he is the Son, eternally the Son. And, but now the language has shifted from talking about the divinity of Christ to talking about his work as the mediator. And so when he th- sits down at the right hand of the Father, having fulfilled all the stipulations of the covenant of redemption, he's now ready to receive all of its blessings, one of which is to be called Son. And it's the name that he will always keep. It's the name he has inherited. It's a perfect tense for those of you who uh, want to know, which means it's an action that has happened in the past that has continuing effects. And the point that we are to understand here is that no angel was ever called son. Sometimes they're generically referred to as sons of God. Uh, Job chapter 1, right? God calls a conference in heaven, and the sons of God appear. The angelic hosts appear. But no angel has ever had the title son applied to them. This is precisely the point that Paul makes, uh, not coincidentally, well, coincidentally, I'm sure, in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection of the, from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a wonderfully Trinitarian verse which emphasizes that upon completion of his mediatorial work, he became the Son in power. So in some sense, due to this covenant of redemption, Jesus Christ was appointed Son of God because of the affirmative action of the Father's resurrection. Christ was exalted by the Father as a result of his perfect completion of the work of redemption, and that in and of itself leads to him being blessed with the name Son. Jesus Christ earned the right to receive his inheritance by his obedience, a point that is continually going to be stressed throughout the book. That is a massive theme. Somebody has to pay. Somebody has to obey. Somebody has to, has to live a perfect life of obedience and die a perfect death. Somebody has to do that. Jesus did it, so you don't have to. Notice also that verse 4 is a comparative statement. It says that the Son, having sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he, uh, as he inherited a more excellent name than they. The comparisons start in the thesis statement. There is the Son and there is angels, and the Son is so vastly superior to the angels, even down to their name. The comparison is made because the author is speaking to people who believe in the authority of the Old Testament. This is brilliant argumentation by the author of Hebrews. Remember, these people are thinking that if I leave this new faith and go back to to the old faith, the Jewish faith, I can make my life a whole heck of a lot easier. And what what the author is saying here is he's saying, okay, if you're tempted to go back to the Old Testament, let me use the Old Testament to show you that you should be having the faith in Jesus and in the new covenant. So I'm going to use what you want to return to as the primary weapon in telling you that you can't go back. Because to go back is to get rid of what's supreme for something that is lesser and so the basic argue of the, argument of the author of the Hebrews is to say, if you embrace anything less than Jesus Christ, you are embracing something lower, something lesser. Do not do that. Don't even do it for angels. And so the author is then going to go back to the Old Testament, and he is going to offer seven Old Testament appeals 
Seven Old Testament defenses of his thesis statement that Jesus' name and therefore his nature and therefore his work and his office are more excellent. Now, we're not going to go back and forth and, and flip around. Uh, if, you know, if you're taking a Hebrews class from me, we do that. But in the sermon, we're just going to, you can flip around later. Uh, but we're just going to make reference to where these verses are found, and you can just kind of write them down and, and, and just kind of play hopscotch through Scripture later if you want. The, the first half of verse uh, 5, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's taken from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, famous messianic psalm. Uh, the verse stresses the unique position that the son possesses. Now, the experience of being begotten has nothing to do with biological reproduction or physical birth. So when, when the uh, scriptures and, and when the confessions talk about Jesus being the only begotten son, they're not talking about begetting in the way that we beget our children. There's eternal generation of the Son, to leak into my theological language, the eternal generation of the Son, He's eternally begotten, right? So it, it's, it does not suggest in any way that there was one time in which Jesus was not equal with God, and then He was begotten, received a name, and then became equal with God. What Psalm 2 is speaking about is that Jesus is what Jesus received as a result of his earthly work as mediator. As we've talked about before, and we'll talk about again, he and the Father agreed before the foundation of the world in the covenant of redemption to work on behalf of our salvation. And in fulfillment of his work of salvation, he received his name. And in the Psalms, that transaction, bad word, but that transaction is referred to as begotten. It describes the appointment of the king and his ascension to the throne in Psalm 2. And so in the psalm, this terminology of appointment and ascension is now transferred onto Jesus. So when you apply this terminology to the true Davidic king, it points to the glorious and visible vindication of the son as he takes his place at the right hand of the Father. So the day of his begetting, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that is the day in which he was resurrected from the dead, the day in which he was exalted to the right hand of the Father. It is only then that his absolute supremacy over all things receives the, its fullness, receives its final stamp. It was only then that he entered into the full exercise of all the authority and was given all the prerogatives that being a son entailed. Paul makes this same point in a, in a sermon that he preaches in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 to 33. He says, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus as also, it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And so, although angels are collectively called sons of God, not one of them is the son of God who has been begotten on account of his mediatorial work. Jesus is better. Second half of verse 5, or again the author says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, we've been through the life of David, and I know that you hear and apply every word that's spoken by me. So you know 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant. It's the Davidic covenant. It contains God's covenantal promise that he will have a son and a successor who is going to stand in unique relationship with God on account of God's giving of his favor to David's line. 
Now, in the context of 2 Samuel 7, we know that that was Solomon. And if you continue reading through 2 Samuel and into the kings, you know that Solomon is eventually going to die. And then this promise, this covenantal promise, is going to then fall to the next generation. And so on, and so on, and so on. For 400 years, for 400 years, the longest single reign of a dynasty in human history, this promise is going to fall to the next generation. But then it's going to stop. Now, I'm bad at math, but I do know that 400 years is not forever and ever. And so in 2 Samuel 7, when God says, I, there's going to be a Davidic king on my throne forever and ever, I know that 400 years is not forever and ever, so there's got to be something more. And so does our author here in Hebrews. So it's obvious then that Solomon was only a type or a foreshadowing of what the true son of David, Jesus Christ, was going to look like. It was a prophetic uh, look into the future. Jesus Christ, who is also the son of God, becomes the true son of David. And it is equally obvious from 2 Samuel 7 that no angel has ever received such an exalted promise. God has never made a covenant with his angels like this that he is committed to fulfilling. Jesus is better. The, the third Old Testament reference is in verse 6. It's, it's either, and we won't get into why it could be, but it's either Psalm 97 verse 7 from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, or it is from Deuteronomy 32 verse 43, or more than likely the author has both of these texts in mind and he just kind of writes them down. What's also kind of unclear is which coming of Christ is in view. So our author says this, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So when he brings the firstborn into the world, what's he talking about? Is he talking about the first coming of Christ in, in the first century? Uh, is he talking about the, the coming of Christ back into the presence of God in his exaltation. In other words, the world is the, is the heavenly world, and he's bringing Christ back into the heavenly world. Uh, or is it referring to the second coming of Christ at the close of history? Which, which world is he bringing him into? Now, it doesn't really matter. I have no idea, but it doesn't matter because the point's the same, right? The point is all the same, that regardless of whether we're talking about his incarnation, his exaltation, or his return, the point still stands that the angels worship Christ. That's the point. The angels worship Christ. He doesn't worship them. They worship him. And this, what, this is what sets apart Jesus from the angels. And quite frankly, it's what sets apart Christianity from all other religions. Jesus may be given a high place, great respect by other religions, by the, by the Jewish faith, by the Islamic faith, uh, even atheists. I've heard even atheists talk and say, you know what, I don't think he's God. He can't be God because there's no such thing as God. But Jesus had a lot of really good things to say, especially in like the Sermon on the Mount. He's a kind, compassionate, and wise man, but that's not enough. That's not enough. He must be worshipped. The angels worship him. Why? Because Jesus is better. Verse 7 is a quote from Psalm 104, verse 4. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, the point of the psalm is that God makes his angels as swift as the wind, as quick as lightning, as they serve him. So when, in other words, when God sends out the angels to serve him, they, they go to it as quickly and as efficiently as is possible. So what does that mean? Well, that means that angels are servants of God. They do the Lord's bidding. They're instruments 
that are used by God to accomplish his will. And Jesus, as a member of the Trinity and as the mediatorial Savior, uses angels as ministers to serve his redemptive purposes, to serve his promises. So no matter how exalted an angel might be, no matter how faithful they might be, no matter how powerful and knowledgeable they are, angels are still creaturely servants who do the bidding of their master. Their master is the Son, Jesus, and the angels serve him. So if the angels worship Jesus and they serve Jesus, what does that mean? Jesus is better. Verses 8 and 9 quote Psalm 45. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Psalm 102, or sorry, Psalm 45 is a marriage song. It's a marriage song written to celebrate the marriage of the king of Israel to his bride. But as is the case throughout the New Testament, as our author looks back at that, as he looks into this psalm, he realizes that this is actually a foreshadowing that the king in this psalm is actually a type of the true king of Israel, the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. The king of Israel here is portrayed as a God, lowercase g, because he acts and he speaks on behalf of God, and he speaks and he acts with God's authority. But when you apply this to Jesus, when you realize that this is the type and Jesus is the anti-type, now you realize that he acts and speaks because he is God. He has authority because he is God. And in verse 9, the the focus turns to the incarnate work of Christ in his life and the result that comes from it. Notice that his exaltation is once again referred to as the author quotes the psalm. So in his nature, he is God. And in the finality of his works, he demonstrates himself to be God. And therefore, Jesus is better. Verses 10 to 12, quote Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. And you, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. In Psalm 102, God is extolled and magnified as the creator of all things. It's a psalm of worship. Everything God has made is worshipped, but or everything that God has made is, is wonderful, but it's temporary. It's transient. Notice the temporary and transient language here. Things are, are rolled up. They're moved beyond. They wear out. The creator is eternal. He's everlasting. He's unchanging. He never wears out. He never can be rolled up. He's not transient. He's the same today as he was yesterday and he is tomorrow. So what is said here, the portrayal that's offered here, is that the one through whom God made the world, remember we're told that already in verse 2, is actually this, this creator that Psalm 102 is referring to. And it's amazing here that what our author is reading in Psalm 102 is he's reading the word Yahweh. He's reading the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. He is the creator. You, Lord, you, Yahweh, laid the foundation. He's saying, yeah, that's that's what Jesus did. Because verse 2 tells us that that he was the one through whom he created the world. So you can apply Yahweh to Jesus because they're both divine. And since they both created, we recognize that he is fundamentally, categorically, qualitatively, quantitatively different than the angels. 
which makes him better. Verse 13 is a quote from Psalm 110, the psalm that Jim read for us this morning. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So to bring his Old Testament, his sevenfold argument from the Old Testament to a close, he makes one final contrast. It's like, do you remember what I said before about him sitting at the right hand of the Father? To no angel has that ever been said. To no angel has God ever said, sit at my right hand until all your enemies are made the footstool. The psalm, again, originally refers to the enthronement of the king and God's promise to the king that God would give him victory over all his enemies. But in the New Testament, this psalm is consistently applied to Jesus. He alone is the one who sits enthroned. He alone is the one to whom all enemies will have to bow the knee, and there is no angel that has ever been given that promise. Seven times, Jesus is better. And there's one more final statement as he, as he kind of wraps up these Old Testament texts in sort of one concluding sort of question. Right? He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? In other words, what's the conclusion we draw from these seven verses? That angels are ministering spirits who minister on behalf of the Father for a specific purpose, which is your redemption. As powerful as they are, as mysterious as they are, as amazing they must be, as, as unbelievable as it must have been for those people who, who have ever seen an angel, angels live to serve God and they live to serve Jesus Christ in his work of redemption. Now, just a warning here. There's going to be several of these types of warnings through Hebrews. Don't get distracted Right? Because the distraction could come in, they serve the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. I have salvation. <gasps> How do angels serve me? Not the point. The text doesn't permit that question to be asked. It's not what our author is trying to communicate. So park that one and forget about it. Make sure you understand the point. The point is not... How do angels minister to me? Do angels minister to me? The point is entirely centered around the contrast between Jesus in his supremacy as God, in his supremacy as Messiah, and the angels in their role of ministry and service to God and to the Messiah. Philip Hughes, one, in one of the commentaries on Hebrews, draws the proper conclusion. The service of angels then is glorious and it's honorable, but the honor and glory of their service is not to be compared with the honor and glory of the Son's rule. They are but instruments in His kingship and their ministry is but an expression of His divine sovereignty. Such teaching emphatically disallows any expectation like that of the Dead Sea Scrolls that some angel in particular, like the archangel Michael or angels in general, will exercise any type of rule any type of authority that rivals or surpasses the leadership and rule and authority of Jesus Christ. That's the conclusion of our author. Let's wrap it up a little more. Augustine wrote, He values not Christ at all who does not value Christ above all. Now, it's theologian speak translated obviously but his basic point is that if if Christ isn't better vastly superior to you than anything else then Christ has no value for you if it's Jesus and it's not Jesus at all and that's the point of our author that's going to be his point throughout the entirety of this book. And even compared with the most powerful creatures in the created world, angels, there is no comparison. It, you, when you try to compare them, it, the comparison just falls away. It just breaks apart because Jesus is so much better 
So let me return, actually, to the very first verse, something that we didn't talk about back then as we conclude our look at these chapters. The very first phrase, having been made more excellent than the angels. Now that, that is a phrase that the author is, is going to use repeatedly to point to one significant thing about Jesus, and that is his costly work as the Messiah. Having become, having become the Savior that he is, now that puts him somewhere that you have to recognize, acknowledge, and fall at your face in worship of. The angels, as glorious and exalted as they are, right? He's not denigrating angels. Let, let me just remind you of that. He's not, he's not telling you that angels are, are to be just sort of pushed aside. But what he's, what he's doing is he's telling us that as glorious and as exalted as they are, no angel has ever been humiliated for you to use the language of Paul from Philippians. No angel ever hung on the cross bearing the full weight of God's wrath for your sin. Only the Son of God has done that. The one who has been begotten. The one who is superior to angels. The one who is the Lord of all angels. The one who is the ruler over the kingdom of God. The creator of the world and who now sits at the right hand of the Father. He is the one who chose humiliation over exaltation, chose crucifixion instead of a fight. No angel ever did that. No angel shed his blood for you. And the father says, you see what my son did for you? You see what he did for you so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be accepted, so that you could be brought into the family of God, so that you can inherit all of the things that I promised to my son? Do you see what he endured on your behalf, the humiliation that he bore for your sins? Nobody's ever done that for you, no angel, no human. So by right of what he did... He is better. And I will give him all that I have promised to him because he bought you. He earned you. And it would be the most unjust thing in this earth for me as the Father not to pour out all blessings on you when you come to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. What angel has ever done that for you? And it's a, it's a beautiful thing that he says, and it's an even more beautiful conclusion that he will draw a few chapters later. Turn to, to Hebrews chapter 4, just really quickly, 14, 15, and 16. We need to read this. Because the result of all of this, his superiority, his supremacy, the fact that he is better results in this. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, that's the language, right? Here we have written, having become, now we have passed through the heavens. Same kind of idea. Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet without sin. And here is what this all means to you. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. So not only is Jesus better than everything, not only is he supreme over all things, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for you. In every circumstance, in every challenge, in every trial, in every tribulation, Jesus is enough. All of the circumstances that you may face, you will find Jesus to be sufficient for whatever it is that you need. You see, when we struggle, most of us don't deny the deity of Christ. 
I assume that your thinking isn't quite there. Shouldn't be there. You don't, you don't struggle and think, oh, Jesus isn't God. No, but I know what we all do. Is Jesus actually better? Is he actually supreme? Is he worth it? Is he enough? If Jesus is enough, right? Is, is, is Jesus enough for you? That if whatever it is that you want so desperately to happen doesn't happen, is Jesus enough? Or do you need that thing to happen that you want to have happen? Or what happens when something that you don't want to happen happens? Is Jesus enough? Or do you need that removed from your life and then Jesus will be enough? You see, the author doesn't just want us to think theologically, Jesus is better than the angels. Yeah, I got that. The hierarchy, I got that. He wants you to say, Jesus is enough. The, the author of Hebrews is right there with you. He knows that you struggle. He knows that trials and temptations and difficulties and persecutions are going to come your way. And when they do, you need to confidently say that Jesus is enough. He's better. He's more. He's superior. He is more excellent. He is all. He is everything. So that we can sing these words with the firmest of belief. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at Hebrews chapter 1, the argument about angels and these Old Testament texts and how they're being used and all that kind of stuff, it, it, it can just boggle our minds. It can be confusing. It can be you know, a rabbit trail that we follow to our own detriment. But Lord, I pray that in all of this, we would hear the words that you want us to. That there is absolutely nothing in this world that is worth turning from Christ for. You are better and you are enough. Lord, I know that there are many people in this congregation who are struggling with things, that are struggling with family members and health and uh, financial issues, and all the rest. And I pray, Lord, that they would be able to lean entirely on your sufficiency and your supremacy. Lord, help them to see that you are enough. Amen.